Hello. Yeah. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this panel is on phosphor uh, social good. So we'll be talking a little bit about uh, you know the, the importance of uh, two things, right? One is FOSS and civil society. So when I when we use the term here as civil society, what we mean is uh, uh, change makers uh, who are sometimes NGOs, not-for-profit organizations, or government agencies, or frontline workers that you might have uh, uh, seen uh, during COVID a lot, right? ASHA workers, Aganwadi workers, etc. All of these wonderful people who kind of come together to solve for problems of most vulnerable communities, right? So we'll be talking a lot from their perspective. And how does FOSS come into the picture? Right? Uh, so I want to start by just setting the context a little bit, which is I heard this from Kailash a long time back. So before 2000, uh, if you look at it, and if you all can look back a little bit, there was hardly any FOSS either, I mean, tech either in business or in, uh, uh, in the change making work that people have been doing. Right? Uh, it was mostly paper and pen driven. Uh, everything was in that kind of a format. And uh, between 2000 to 2015, it became tech uh, enabled. That was the big word, right? So a lot of people started collecting data. And then data became a measure of whether impact is happening or not, right? Uh, websites started coming up. So NGOs suddenly have visibility of the wonderful work that they're doing. People could donate to NGOs using uh, payment buttons. And after 2015, it was a uh, lot of... Uh, tech-driven impact, right? where tech itself has become the impact. Nowadays, there are tools where you could uh, even uh, just put in your social benefit number, like an Aadhaar card, and anyone in any remote village in India is able to figure out you know, what are the benefits uh, that I'm eligible from the side of the government. right? So tech, from being enabled, is now becoming, is driving impact, correct? And then now, with AI, things are moving at a much faster uh, pace, right? But as this has been happening, right, tech tends to exclude vulnerable communities. And it tends to exclude all these wonderful people that work with vulnerable communities, right? And when I, use, when I say tech, and forces also tends to be a culprit sometimes in this. So we have this wonderful panel with us uh, today. So we have Akhila uh, from Tech for Good uh, Community. We have Ramya Ma'am from uh, Wheelie Foundation. Uh, and uh, we have Vinay and Akhilesh, who both are part of Avni and Project Tech for Dev. They'll also tell a little bit about themselves while they answer uh, the questions, right? But let's get started. Ramya, why don't, uh, uh, why don't we start with, I mean, we would want to start with you. In the, what is the work that We Live Foundation does? And uh, uh, what are the barriers in that work that you do? And how did you figure out which are of those barriers can be solved with tech? Thanks, Shimi. Thanks for that. Um, so We Live Foundation is an NGO that works with uh, uh, young people between the age of 18 to 21, 23. Right? And these are young people who step out of institutions, childcare institutions. So um, I don't know how, at the age of 18, what each of us were doing. You can just do a flashback. I think many of you may still be 18. But uh, you know, <laughs> for people like us, if you think what we were doing at 18, we would have probably been happily roaming around, uh, figuring out where to go, what movie to watch kind of a thing. But for the young people in our institution, it is figuring out where the next meal is going to come from, where they're going to sleep for the night. Because at 18, they become adults, and they are expected to leave the institutions where they have grown up, the orphanages and shelter homes where they have been raised. So we offer a program for them uh, where there is residential space. They can come there. They can figure out the next steps of their life. They receive a lot of mentoring support uh, education, skilling, all that is a part of it. A lot of mental well-being, physical well-being, emotional well-being support. And the idea is when they feel ready, they step out. And even when they step out, most of our young people will be alone. It's not like they're going to go back to a community or they're going to go back to a uh, you know, family because they don't have that kind of a support system. So the idea is that they have to be capable of managing life on their own when they step out. So that's the kind of work that we do, Shamir. And coming to the challenges that we face, um, I would like to split it into three. The first one would be that um, just understanding the needs of a community like this is very, very complex. It's very difficult. You know, if you have one teenager at home trying to figure out what that person needs, you know, would be, would be, it's, it's a very big puzzle. Imagine having 100 or 200 people and coming up with a program that is going to cater to the needs of the individual 
is a very big challenge. And that is something I think we are going to keep cracking no matter how big or how many years we work in the system. The second would be while they are in the program, how do we uh, you know, figure out, track, monitor, what all the inputs that are given to these young people under the program. That is a very real challenge that we face on a daily basis because you know, there are so many of them and so many things are happening. Uh, who's keeping track of it? That is definitely one. The third would be, which of course is something which is a very common question for all NGOs, which is how do you measure the impact once they move out of, the, of our system and they start living on their own? How do we know that what we have done whether it is having some effect or not, how do we do course corrections, how do we track them for life, because it's, it's not the end. Many, many, many young people who come out of institutions, they say that, yes, you were with us for 18 years or you were with us for so many years, but what happened after that? You just let go of us, right? And uh, nobody is tracking them, they become ghosts. So these are the three, three challenges that we face of which I think tech can help us with the second and the third challenge very, very well, right? Uh, so uh, right, right now we are in different places doing different kinds of work. We need to track, we need to know what the other person is doing. So uh, the first one, yes, it's a challenge that as an NGO we're going to have. I don't think the tech can help us, but yes, the, the, the second and the third one, we really need tech to help us and it will help us save a lot of time. That's uh, very interesting. So, uh, apart from your day-to-day -day operations and managing things, right, how to, I mean, what you can't measure, you can't improve, right? So, how do you measure your work so that you can constantly Absolutely. improve it? Absolutely. And uh, I rem and you did make a good attempt at this, right? So, what were your, uh, when you were trying to leverage tech, what were some of the challenges that you faced? So, one thing is that uh, trying to understand what our tech needs was. That itself was a very big challenge because we, we are not from a tech background. So, we won't know, you know, what, like, what you don't know you can't measure, what you don't know you need, how do you, how do you put that on paper and find, find the gap. So, that was a very big challenge for us. So, we took the help of experts, people like you who've been working in this field to come and study our work and come up with some some needs, identify the needs that we have. That was the first challenge. The second was once we identified the needs, we needed to figure out who could help us fill the needs, right? Uh, and there we got really confused because there are so many options out there, so many people out there. Uh, and some things are free, some things are at a cost. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was quite difficult for us to navigate that space. Beyond the point, it came to such a level that um, it became too big a project. And we kind of said, uh, you know, we'll halt it for now because, and it, the bandwidth, right? NGOs don't have that much bandwidth for tech. Our work is probably with the young people. If, if the team is going to sit with tech developers and debug and, you know, if I have to input something and it's not working kind of a thing, we don't have that kind of bandwidth. It's very likely the team will say, I'll give this up. Let me write down, write it down, or go back to my Excel sheet, kind of a thing, right? So, um, uh, so identifying the need, finding out what would be the best way to fill the need, making sure that we sustain with what we pick up, right? That 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 I was really afraid of because looking at the size of the project, we became afraid if you know we would be able to sustain it. What if we gave it up after six months because our program is, needs more time than the tech. Right? So we, we were really afraid of that. Um, and the last would definitely be that people who are operating the tech. So I've been told that tech doesn't fail by itself. It fails because the people using it fail to use it. Right? So as NGO people uh, training our staff, making sure that they are using, they have to see the inherent good in the system. Only then it will become self-sustaining. So that was the fourth challenge uh, that we faced. Right. Hey, thanks, Ramya, for sharing warmly and freely, right, of the failures also, and that's important. Uh, uh, so in a way, kind of, uh, uh, I come to Akhila now, because Akhila, you've been working, you and your wonderful team uh, have been working uh, side by side with NGOs for the last five years, at least, right? Uh, whether it is online or hand in hand in the field, uh, uh, the, and just being there, providing them that psychological safety as they navigate through the burger menu and the teen bindu buttons, right? Uh, how does what uh, Ramya said resonate with you? And uh, according in your experience, what have been your insights around, oh, these are some of the top needs uh, and uh, why uh, you have chosen a very clear force path, right? By force. So uh, your thoughts around that. 
Thanks, Shami. Thank you for having us. Um, so I think um, a lot of us today, um, at least here, yesterday and today has been such a revelation for us in the social space when we're talking about tech because we're, we're so far behind. We're still talking about um, democratizing data, make your data articulate, uh, articulation better, move it from pen and paper to at least an Excel. So there are multiple layers in which we are struggling. And I think the core of and the crux of all these problems arise because the data is not, it, it is not sorted for an organization. We don't know where we collect it. We don't know how to visualize it. We don't know how to make sense of it. We don't know how to evaluate the work that we've been doing. And this is a problem that most organizations across the country face. Um, we've worked with about 1,000 plus organizations today. And from the, um, um, the research that we've done, we figured that 90% of organizations do not have a tech budget, nor do they have tech resources. And 70% of them have their data in silos. They have multiple projects that they work on. The data is all over the place. We don't have a complete analysis and understanding of what, and I completely agree with you, and understand and empathize with you when you say uh, that that is an issue. And that is literally the issue. And we're talking about how FOSS can move the needle here. Right? And something as small as just a free and no code solution, which is again free and open source, um, can be used for organizations to help them with data collection. Many such tools like Kobo Toolbox is something that we recommend because it's easy, to, it's got an easy interface, and, it's, uh, and organizations can easily adopt it without much of capacity building. So it's not just about giving great quality tech products to a nonprofit, it also means that you'll have to handhold and support build capacity in order for them to use the tool sustainably. Um, that is one, and we also have other tools like that we've been working on extensively is ERP Next, Prape. Um, we've also worked on Metabase for data visualization because the point is that the data that you collect needs to tell you a story of the work that you've been doing. And in order to do so, you collect data from the ground real time, and most of the places is that it gets so difficult that there is no internet connection. And we have been in places like that, that we've struggled in order to make our data sync. It's happened, it is a very common issue. I know it does not, it might not be such a big issue here today, but most grassroots organizations across the country face that issue. And to be able to visualize the data that they've been collecting all along is also a very important aspect of this journey. Um, and sim since Metabase is becoming, I mean, it is a very easy tool, it's a drag and drop, not a lot of people need to have too much tech talent within their teams in order to handle a tool like this, it's easy. Same with ERP Next, where we're using it for all operational verticals. It could be right from your fundraising needs to your HR, finance, um, uh, your monitoring evaluation, task management, any single thing. We look at like a centralized system that can enable a nonprofit to do that, low code, Solution, easy to customize on your own. With a little bit of hand-holding and capacity building, organizations are able to adopt these systems easily. And um, that's, I think that's a highlight of what we would say as tools. Thanks, Akila. I think you highlighted two points here, right? One is uh, tech is not, a lot of the tech that the NGOs needs, like you said, you just like for 15 minutes rapid round of all the wonderful tech that is already freely and openly available. But usually tech is only 2% of the problem, yeah. right? So if it is a website thing, tech is probably 2%, you just have to use WordPress for it. But writing content is the remaining 98% of the problem, right? Yeah. And uh, when it is fundraising, uh, payment gateways, two minutes. Uh, but writing a fundraising story can take uh, two to three months, right? So if understanding what is the underlying problem behind the tech is something uh, that you've been helping a lot of organizations yeah. with uh, as well, right? Yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the OASIS initiative, but we'll come back to you on that because you said something very interesting around uh, how to make tech more relevant to vulnerable communities, right? Yeah. More useful. And I wanted to bring Vin Vinay. Vinay. So Vinay, you, uh, you and your teams have been obsessed with FOSS for Social Good for a while now. And one of the things I really love about the work that you do is uh, when you work with NGOs and when the NGO says that, hey, we need this, uh, you don't doubt them, right? So you don't say like, uh, oh, this, doesn't, this won't work if there is no internet. You actually take that extra step to make sure that your app works offline. Now, how many of we know apps that work offline today? Nobody cares, right? Because most of the apps that are available. So what is the thinking behind that? And you said something very interesting about it's not why uh, FOSS, uh, why NGOs should adopt FOSS, but uh, something else interesting that you are saying. Uh, okay, so at least we'll tell a story in the first place. So 
we never wanted to develop software and then go see. The reason why we started with Avni in the sense was that, uh, so we used to have Bumni. We started working with Bumni, which is a hospital and information system. And uh, we used to visit this place called Lok Biratri Prakalp, which is in Himalka Sahib, Maharashtra. And one of the things they told us, and this is not we observing, they told us was that there's a bunch of villages which get completely cut off from healthcare during the monsoon. And they wanted to do simple things like, during the monsoon, obviously, there's a lot of mosquitoes coming in, so lots of malaria. <laughs> and you also have cases of very simple things, diarrhea, things that can be easily treated for which you can keep tablets. But not, now the problem is, how do you, di I mean, diagnosis is easy because they have field workers there who would diagnose this. But the problem is, how do you, like, what they don't know is what the dosage is. Like, based on the weight and the age of the person, you need to give a dosage. And that's where this whole thing started. And obviously it's cut off, which means you don't even have roads coming in. So internet is like out of the question. So that's where the software really started. And the only way you can really go out and uh, like figure out problems with this is actually if you work closely with those NGOs. So like us tech people, we should probably just go visit places outside us, even within the cities. There are lots of places that we can go visit where you can look at problems and then think about tech solutions, always validate with the users and then come back. So, so you take the you don't focus on the product but on the process, right? So you focus a lot on an inclusive process where working together with the people who are going to use your product, uh, take the features from there, and most pro and from mostly what I'm hearing is you are always listening to what they were saying, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So the entire like roadmap comes completely from people who are asking, and usually even at an NGO level, people who are paying for it. It's wow. very important okay. because they feel the need so much that they're ready to pay to fix their problem. And that's really like useful from our perspective as a barometer to know how important something is. That's a great step. So one is uh, uh, that they are putting, uh, they are able to afford it, first of all. I think one of the reasons is also that they are able to afford it. Uh, and uh, we have heard a lot about this uh, from others as well. You know, a lot of NGOs end up, and I'm sure in the non-NGO uh, world as well, uh, uh, the story of proprietary software, right? So what's what's been your, you have gone to many of these uh, change makers and must have seen their pain with proprietary software, uh, right? So any stories or insights from that, uh, Akhila? Yeah, lots to share. <laughs> um, in fact, um, proprietary um, to, I mean, let me start with what is tech for nonprofits first, right? We don't understand the difference in our ecosystem between free and free and open source software. So that is the basic foundation that we've got to understand that not everything that's free is open source. And that's, we're all doing a, we're literally running crash courses for nonprofits and helping them understand what that actually means. What does it mean to be having a free and open source software? And um, in most cases that when we go and talk to organizations, our experience has been that, hey, this tool is free. So I might as well use it, and uh, it, it doesn't really matter to me as long as it covers my needs. But an organization, when you start off, you're doing something else, and as you start scaling along the years, the tool does not grow with you. And that is a real-time problem with proprietary software, which is extremely limiting to organizations that are in their scale, or their journey to scale. Right, so it um, so this way we've seen organizations spend close to 25, 30 lakhs on systems, which could be done with just a hosting of maybe five to six dollars, uh, which could have been a case. But organizations, due to the lack of awareness, end up spending so much money because they don't know the difference between what is proprietary and what is open source, and that's sort of why we are also in the space doing it. We've seen a lot of organizations struggle because proprietary does not allow us to build further on the software. Um, and most of proprietary tools that are out there that nonprofits in India use today are not even local. They don't, they, it's not even homegrown in India. There are tools that are globally well known, but if you have to add an extension to an, a, a, a proprietary software, then it is very difficult for us to add it because it's not possible to do it. And that's when they begin to realize that, okay, this is not for me. This is too expensive and it is extremely limiting, um, and this does not really support my programmatic growth. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, Vinay, uh, uh, you, 
adding to what Akhila was saying here, right? From a code perspective, what does it mean, right? You, from a process perspective, you said how you get your use cases, everything. But when you're writing code for FOSS for social good, is it very different from general FOSS itself? Because FOSS in itself is a very non-ego system sort of a play. It's always very empathetic in that way, uh, right? So what is the difference uh, when, as a software engineer, when you put that hot hat on, Right. What are the things uh, that uh, you would tell maybe the audience here or the general audience that why we should not use proprietary software and stick to FOSS, whether it is, uh, and especially in the case for uh, social good? So a lot of the benefits of open source in the social sector are very much the same as the benefits of social, uh, like open source in the regular tech sector. Uh, the, there are slight differences in the sense like you mentioned Metabase for example. Metabase has nothing to do with social sector, it's just open source. Yeah. And which is nice, the, lots of them needs to be there. And lots of so solutions are actually good in a sense because you have a wider community of usage. So it kind of helps. Now when we build tools specific for the social sector, there are a few things that we kind of take care of. And I look back to my memories when I was creating, like the first time when I started doing this was in some NGO in uh, New Delhi. I happened to build a system which was open source and everything, but six months later I moved, the, moved cities, which means that they don't have any support system anymore. So open source by itself doesn't really help the NGO. And this is kind of a problem that we have, that happens through developers like me. Organizations like where I worked, where people actually built something for free and handed it over to NGOs, but then, as you said, uh, it doesn't, you still need it to be maintained over time. And they don't, ha like, you don't have another budget to maintain that extra software. And that usually, like, brings to, like, a graveyard of multiple projects. So some of the things that I'm thinking of is, again, going back to what Akhila you said is product-centric. Like, when you build, always think of products so that... It is something, it's a package that can be used, that can be used by multiple people. And if it's used by multiple people, there will be obviously some ecosystem around it to support it. And uh, there are a lot of ecosystems around here which we can talk about as well uh, to support these kind of force for social good. You need to have funders. Like, for example, you have uh, Linux is funded by people who really care about Linux for their business success. Now, who cares about the success of these uh, NGOs? So both from a funding perspective, from a developer perspective. Uh, it's slightly different. There's a different community altogether, but it is there. Uh, any popular, I mean, you've been work, you have worked in a few organizations as well, but uh, for the sake of, for us, for the sake of the audience and the conversation, what are some four or five uh, technology for good, uh, FOSS uh, for good uh, companies or initiatives that uh, in India uh, that you've heard about uh, that we could all look up and join? From my personal experience, definitely before uh, uh, I work at Samanvai Foundation, which is like on the technology side, building stuff. Uh, obviously, there is somebody who's working on the glyphic side. This FOSS United itself, which kind of uh, supports quite a lot of work for software in the development sector. There is obviously Bumni, which is like another piece of software that I'd worked with uh, that is uh, completely supported by uh, ThoughtWorks. Uh, FOSS United, I should say, here because like, uh, in terms of both supporting and even like the whole Oasis group also kind of started from people from FOSS United. So that's also one a big, huge initiative. Uh, C4GT, that's a big initiative that was uh, like, the, it kind of helps students specifically get into, te get into technology and get connected with government tech and to build those bridges between students, developers, and the people who are already working in government tech. I think that's a great initiative. Uh, I'd also want to talk about Tech for Dev, which is like another organization which kind of builds as well as funds uh, open source. It's for great, yeah. I think uh, ten, uh, probably five, six years ago, when I, we had probably one or two, right? So it's so wonderful now that uh, we quite have an abundance of uh, uh, organizations that are doing this great work. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask Akhilesh now. Akhilesh, you are from Project Tech for Dev, right? Uh, and you, uh, you, you spoke very passionately about this code for uh, GovTech, right? Which is uh, C4GT, right? Uh, what, what was the problem that uh, you were trying to solve and how did you 
get because generally there is uh, a scarcity of tech talent in the social sector, right? Uh, if you compare it with people who are working on pressing a button to get a cab, right? <laughs> so, uh, 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 how do you then? Uh, what is the problem that you were working on? And tell us a bit more about Project Tech for Dev and the C4GT uh, uh, program that you did. Yeah. So, if I have to summarize in a single line. I would say that Project Tech for Dev is basically a technology partner in social sector. And C4GT, with C4GT we had quite a success. And uh, there actually we realized that organizations like us who want to like uh, cater to the community of social sector through tech wants to or take steps to support these communities like C4GT. We have to like uh, put some effort and time with these new contributors who are just fresh out of the college. So we need to like, uh, there is nothing like a big feature which is just a college graduate can contribute to an existing project. So what you need to do as an organization, you have to like break it down into the smaller chunks and uh, assign them those small issues, mm -hmm. spend time with them, like uh, helping them understand what your product in general do and uh, what is the feature, how that feature will help many other people. So if you spend time there, of course, there will be like uh, the people who are mentoring. There will be like uh, they will be spending time in mentoring rather than like delivering. So, in terms of like productivity, it will go down. But if you see on a longer term that the success you get or like more community members you add through like involving more into these projects, that is uh, like helpful in medium term and long term as well. And in C4GT, we had like four projects under Tech for Dev. And we had like 60 PRs, 60 issues that were addressed, and their code was merged. That was a great success. And one more area where we should step up is like deliberately putting effort into making this experience, like contributing experience to the project, very much like great for these new contributors, so that like it does not feel like they they were like reaching out to us, but we were not answering. And then they said that in graduation, I tried like contributing to social sector, but my experience was not good. I will not come back again. So you need to like make some effort there to have overall experience good. That's where we also had this quarterly sprints where we meet in person. And we invited this C4GT contributor also to meet us in person. So having those human interactions is a great thing. I've heard a lot about the sprints, and uh, I'm sure people can look up C4GT, Tech for Dev, and all of this. So you said something very interesting. So if if a person here or anyone wants to contribute uh, uh, to FOSS for social good, it's not like there is only you have to take up a full-time career, or you have taken up that choice, which is great, right? Uh, wonderful to see people who are committed to it. In the But there are so many other avenues as well, right? So uh, what I'm hearing from you is you can start from a level one, where if you have some time with you, just look up for these programs and contribute piecewise, even that has so much impact. It's not that you have to come full time somewhere here. At level two, it's like uh, maybe commit to an organization like We Live and say that we'll give you five hours uh, in a month and I'll help you with these. Like be uh, your friend and partner in this. That could be a level two uh, if you have mo some more time with you. And uh, at a level three is uh, where probably you can start taking up a regular, uh, I mean, you're so uh, excited by what is happening. Then there are full time jobs that are available and these are all some of the names that you heard. Uh, I even saw hiring boards outside uh, and things like that. So please do look up. So there are full-time jobs that are available. And at level four is like there is entrepreneurial opportunity, right? Social entrepreneurs who can start building where these gaps are. Like Avni is actually a product of social entrepreneurship in that way. Glyphic and Project Tech for Dev have a lot of products that are in the social entrepreneurship and sustainability uh, type. It's not, uh, it's not like an, uh, people have this sense that, oh, you're an NGO or an NPO, but it's more like we are not for loss organizations, right? Trying to do impactful work. So it's wonderful uh, to see that, you know, there are multiple pathways that are available. Uh, how, how long have you been in, the, in this space, uh, Akhilesh? So I'm a developer at Tech for Dev, and I've been part of Glyphic for like past three years. For, so past three years, I was like full time working on Glyphic. Okay. And so, but uh, like Akila also mentioned, like uh, we spend quite a time with NGOs and we hear their problem. That's where like most of our products and initiatives uh, are from, that we hear the problem, we see that, okay, there are many NGOs which are facing similar problem, so we should start contributing or start building something on top of that. Like one of our initiative is Glyphic, which is our two-way communication platform 
because they especially it gave birth uh, during COVID, where like earlier what NGOs do that they have these field visits with their beneficiary. That's like a primary contact with their beneficiary. But after COVID, it was like physical interaction was not possible. So they need like some tool to communicate with their beneficiaries. That's where Glyphy came into the picture. That uh, And also WhatsApp is like a household name now. That even our grandfathers, grandmothers uh, know, OK, WhatsApp is there. With, you can do communication. So that's where Glyphy came into the picture, that NGOs can interact with their beneficiary through WhatsApp. So that's Glyphic. Another is data development pl platform, which is Dalgo. So like Akila also mentioned that NGOs have their data spread across multiple channels. They have like Google Sheet. There is already some software database, which is there having all that data. Also, they had like old data, which is like more pen and paper. But they are like slowly converting it to like in a digital digitalized form. But it is still ac spread across multiple channels. So Dalgo actually works on that, that uh, all these uh, different sources can be merged into a single place. And from there only, you can like generate reports. Also for funding, you can get reports also to check like what was the impact of your program. So for any contributors, uh, they can contribute here. That's great. So you already have a bunch of tools that, uh, that are very specifically working, force tools that are solving specific problems for the social uh, space. And the good thing, I mean, the thing that I'm seeing a lot is uh, it's moving from being, and I was telling Akhila and I have been working in this space for a while now, and we are seeing the space move from like an ecosystem to an ecosystem, right? Where everybody is helping each other and uh, one out. Like Akhila said, just because there is a free Gmail account does not mean I'm, I will Everyone will write amazing emails, right? So though FOSS tools, someone is developing great FOSS tools, somebody is going to the field and helping them train on those FOSS tools, right? And there are a lot of volunteers and uh, students, in fact, who are coming through the C4GT and other programs by Samagra and your own sprints that you are running. Uh, we are getting better at learning to ask for help. I think as a sector, we were quite reluctant to ask for help. That also was a challenge sometimes. We believe that, oh, we are doing something great, so they should come and help us. But I think we are getting better and better from what Lakhilaj was saying, ki, you know, uh, please come and help us, you know, we need your help, you know, can you come and sit with us and help us solve these problems is something we are saying. In that, uh, I, I know uh, some of you are already part of it. Uh, Akhila, can you tell us something about uh, Oasis uh, Alliance and what is it all about? Um, so the Oasis Alliance is basically the open source alliance that we formed. Um, a bunch of us in the social sector have come together in order to promote open source as a concept, as, um, um, as a solution for various, the entire citizen sector of India, where we're saying that, hey, here is something that you didn't know of. We're trying to help uh, increase adoption of FOSS, first raise awareness and tell you what that is, talk to you about different tools that's out there. And in fact, there's Avni, there's Glyphic, there's so many other tools that are already open source and made for the sector and other tools that are available also in the ecosystem that can be adopted regardless whether you're a for-profit or a non-profit organization, you can still adopt it. So the core of this being that it is uh, it is a driving force that is helping, uh, enabling the social space in order to uh, have seamless adoption of force. So that's what we're doing at Oasis and uh, this is the first, uh, we just finished our first event in September. Um, we had a lot of, um, uh, success in terms of how many organizations came were interested to learn and were almost ready or you know are becoming tech ready in order to adopt such solutions that are out there as well so that's a little bit about oasis we also have the oasis wiki um, which has a lot of non-profit friendly tools uh, which are force again that e that are easy to install easy to adopt no code solutions uh, low code solutions everything that's available so here is a group that is trying to uh, you know we're literally trying to ensure that the adoption becomes easy uh, we're still in the very early stages of our journey there's a lot more to achieve but at least we've scratched the surface at this point so yeah so that's a, so for anyone who wants to look up it's oasis o a s i s h q headquarter h q dot com uh, we are still like i said we are we are looking for people like you so if you want to know 
more about what these all these tools and these names that you have heard. Uh, want to connect with all of us? Uh, just you uh, you can just go and join the newsletter there, and we'll start. We've started sending out some of these communications and future events and things like that. Right? Um, I want to like, kind of wrap down. I think uh, it's been too serious uh, stuff, at least from for me. Uh, Rame, you tell me you are you are a teacher, right? And uh, you you are so obsessed with providing care for these young people. Uh, uh, tech is not something that uh, <laughs> excites you, but still, if I were to force you and tell you, what was that one uh, moment uh, or experience that you had around using tech that makes you very happy? Because you can be quite childlike, <laughs> and you're being quite so. Share with the. Yeah. So um, when we started, it was just a one-man organization, one-woman organization, right? So you have to get the bathroom cleaner as well as maintain the website. And uh, uh, and website was very important because people had to know what work we are doing. And um, once we started the work, we had to upload the photos of all what our young people, you know, what they are accomplished, etc., on this uh, page. And um, I don't know tech, so what I would do is I would go to that thing, I would copy paste the code that is there above in the previous line, paste that here and then put the photo image here and try it out. I would say, what is that, upload or something, and then go quickly to the page and see. And the photo had to be in the middle and it would be here. Then I would go back again, figure out where some other copy paste, absolutely no clue, but I remember this one night I spent doing all of this because we had a board meeting in the morning and I had to show the board something, and, and it was more or less all right, you know, it, not exactly aligned, but kind of a thing. That was very nice. I felt quite. Even now, I do it on our donations page, etc. All copy paste, without knowing the code. As a, uh, I mean, I've known you for a bit now, so I felt that most of the NGOs who adopt tech are actually tinkerers at heart, right? They are kind of fearless and uh, kind of doubtful when I tell them it's free. I remember you saying, "Are you really sure that it is free?" Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so actually, you have worked a lot with uh, frontline workers, right? Uh, especially training them. Uh, and generally, we've been talking a lot about how FOSS also tends to exclude these deskless workers because whenever we design tech, our UI UX tends to uh, talk about the smartphone, the iPhone. Nobody's thinking about the feature phone, the low uh, phone. So while you are working with them and helping them, uh, do, do you think uh, can you think of something that inspired you or an incident? Yeah, uh, sure. So I think I'd like to go back to six years ago when we first started Tech for Good Community. And we were stationing ourselves in various rural areas, working with grassroots organizations, lived there, understood their problems, and tried to do something without knowing what to do. Um, and um, there is no concept of explaining force there. Nobody cares. Nobody will even, uh, nobody really cares, honestly. It's just that, will this make my job easy or no? If it doesn't, I don't want it. So that's literally how the, uh, how our experiences with grassroots organizations has been. Um, we've started, we started working with them on a very basic thing uh, where we wanted to help them with data collection because they had lost their data um, to a flood uh, with 20,000, oh no, sorry, 10,000 member data was completely lost. Uh, and this was the work of 20 years. Then there is no, there is no uh, this thing sign of anything that they've done and their funding was also at stake for the next year because they didn't have data and because the data was on paper and because there was a flood. So these are the problems that you face on ground. It is not about whether you think of FOSS or what is the most user-friendly tool that's out there. You're looking at what will solve my issue now. So um, this is where we started using Kobo Toolbox because it was, it's fairly simple and it had nothing to do with, there was no coding required. We, and it is also multilingual and it works offline. So these were our qualifying features. And it's been six years. They still use the tool. There has been no problem. They are completely digitized. All of their systems are, they have a centralized MIS. They, they don't know, they don't care whether it's FOSS or not. It's still working. But the point is that it was, it was FOSS. That's also one of the reasons why they're still able to build further on it, on their Kobo forms or anything. So the, uh, I think that was one of our, um, I wouldn't call it an aha moment, but it was a, it's a, it, it was a point and very pivotal for us to see that if an organization which is um, run by Dalit rural women uh, who haven't had any experience or exposure to technology have been able to adopt a simple FOSS solution, 
it can be replicated across the country. So that's where, uh, that is one of our inspiration. Very today. nice, yeah. I think this is JMS, right? Ah, okay, nice. Uh, Vinay, anything from the field, especially uh, uh, organizations that have used Avni, right? If you look back and think of one or two, one incident where you were really, wow, I didn't think that they could have used it like this. Because I've been to a lot of uh, Avni demos where uh, most of the time, the users themselves will talk about Avni, right? And these are healthcare workers from the really rural areas, and the founder is just sitting there <laughs> and uh, listening to them. Uh, so, uh, any anything that comes to mind? So, there was uh, during this uh, COVID time, right? So, we we used to hold conferences just to understand how people were really taking it, taking it. And there's been a lot of uh, like people being laid off in this sector because. <coughs> You don't need your workforce because they cannot go out anyways. And then there's this, uh, like, two or three organizations just uh, started talking and they said, uh, we have Avni, we can just call up people and <laughs> collect their data. So uh, we do all our services from home. So that's something we never thought was possible, but they kind of adapted to the situation. And because you have this mechanism to uh, collect data, every funder knows that you've gone and done your work. And they are the people are actually getting care for that matter, and like we didn't know these things were actually happening, and until we actually had that conference and figured things out, so that was like an aha moment for us. Akhilesh, how about you? And uh, especially since you have chosen this at a very early stage in your career, uh, what makes you stay? Uh, I mean, what makes you get up every day in the morning and do FOSS for social good? Yeah, for us, like we as a developer, like are more focused on okay, how many features I can add, and uh, like it is uh, like a milestone. We even don't care much about the bug fixes, but we are not that excited because it takes like a bit of more time to like g get a bug fixed. But uh, for me, like which gets me going every day, is like uh, this is the complete loop. So for developer, you are just like focusing on like, okay, I push this many lines of code, I have committed daily, I have this streak running on, but uh, if you create a feature, and then you actually talk to the end user or NGOs which are actually using your software. And then they talk about how it is impacting so many beneficiaries, how someone's life is being uplifted. So then you, when you talk to them, and that's what we kind of do in sprints, where we talk with NGOs, hey, what are the problems that you are facing? And okay, how you have been using the platform? And they, when they tell these stories, like that is the uh, moment for us, okay. This feature I wrote, but I never imagined it will be used like this, or these many lives will be affected in a good manner with this feature only. Thank you. Thanks, Akilesh. Uh, I'll uh, kind of bring this to our app now and uh, uh, use this as an opportunity from all of us. And uh, I said learning to ask for help. So we would like to, as a collective, ask you for your help. Uh, please do find out all these uh, names that you would have heard. Join the OSS uh, HQ newsletter. Contribute both code and, if possible, money uh, to all these wonderful FOSS uh, 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 products and uh, projects and organizations. Uh, there was Internet Freedom Foundation that works some tremendous work, Tinker Hub Foundation, Tech for Good Community, We Live Foundation, right? Do contribute and encourage others to also contribute both uh, uh, code and uh, money because a small amount of money over a long period of time by a large number of people on a monthly basis like a Netflix subscription, right? Uh, it really creates a lot of uh, uh, sustainability or diversity into how FOSS can become sustainable in the social good space as well. Yeah. So thank you for being a great audience and listening peacefully. We can probably take a few questions if there are, uh, but we have kind of used up all the time. Uh, they seem to be quite busy, so any questions? Ah, yeah, please. Is there, is there a mic there? Um, give, him, give him a mic. Anyone else wants to ask can also raise their hand, so we'll start getting in the... Hello, yeah. Uh, hi, Akela, I have a question directed towards you. It's like uh, you said that your uh, NGO is using some kind of FOSS tool or software product. I can't see you. <laughs> okay, there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, your NGO is using some kind of FOSS product or software. Like, so who is managing their infrastructure, the backups, and like uh, 
product updates and all that yeah because like i think in pen and paper it's quite comparatively simple like you can just like make a copy of it like xerox it on something yeah. but for infra like how do you manage it who's ensuring that they are paying for their infra or like right. you know stuff like that not just using it like yeah. everyone can use a yeah. laptop but great question um i think that's also one of the reason why we're building out this entire ecosystem and community of contributors to come and support us because we are all lean teams here we're all lean teams we don't have more than 20 people in our teams each and that's the goal that we're building towards that we at this point maintain infrastructure each one of us do right so uh, but the goal is that we're able to bring on community uh, contributors from the fos community to be able to help maintain this ecosystem sustainably uh, yes that is a definite easy way to use pen and paper but there are incidents that happen like to jms that it goes with flood every now and then and organizations spend close to 50000 rupees in order to digitize the data that they collect on paper so we already have a huge scarcity in terms of having tech budgets within organizations and this is an extra layer but if we are able to figure out easy and sustainable cloud hosting solutions like that would cost between 5 to 6 dollars a month it still works so right now it's us who is maintaining this ecosystem it's us who is solving for problems it's us who is doing the bug fixing but we ideally like the community to grow and that's where we're uh, i mean inviting all contributors to join us so just a follow up uh, what if you lose the data because of some kind of uh, issue because i've seen like a lot of big mnc's also wipe out their databases or like yeah. it goes away simply right like so and how, like how do you like export that data like let's say sometimes you like, like i'm not saying it should but you dissolve like the next year so how are they going to like export their data out a uh, fantastic point again and that's where we help organizations upload their data in their own instances we don't have any data that we keep with ourselves so what we do is that we build we customize we code with empathy and give the project hand it over to the non profit only come in as and when they require our support but i would also like um, uh, 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 akilesh and uh, vinay to tell you more about that because they have tools that they are managing data from and that will also be a little more in, uh, they would add layers to your question but for us we don't have we don't have any data on our instances every organization has its own cloud hosting has its own instance and it stays with them okay uh, any any other questions we're almost at the end so we are the only oh yeah good excuse me uh i wanted to ask to basically each one of you if we wanted to reach out to collaborate or contribute in any way uh, how can we do that yeah to collaborate uh, what i would suggest is we are all part of this alliance called uh, oasis hq so oasishq.com we have a newsletter there uh, you can just add your email to that that will be one place where you will be able to find us it's still a work in progress and in fact we need people like you to come and help put the wiki together and uh, more and more volunteers so that might be a great place to start right uh, yeah sorry it's dot org hello uh, it's oasishq.org oh dot org oh, you <laughs> and uh, um Uh, and also there are already i am sure you must be part of uh, uh, fos united discourse groups right uh, so that's also a great place to just put uh, what we have seen is uh, if people are willing to just learn to ask and reach out uh, there are multiple ways to do start uh, following people that you found here as role models you must have heard a lot of talks right and then automatically linkedin will do the rest of the job and connections right? so just start following people following these posts uh, and things like that thank you for asking the question any anyone else okay anyway we are all available here even after the closing ceremony for some time and uh, thank you so much uh, to the panel for having come all the way and then uh, shared warmly and freely with all of us yeah